What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke aka Dazzleweight here and welcome back to more from this Final Fantasy X Ultimania series. I've had a little bit of a break from this to focus on some other projects but thank you to everybody that's been watching these videos so far and I'm glad that you guys have been enjoying it. I will be continuing to share with you stories from the developers of Final Fantasy X using translations from the Final Fantasy X Ultimania guide. As always, the lovely Dawn has been kind enough to translate interviews from the creator salon section of the book and for this part of the series, we are going to be enjoying a discussion about the music of Final Fantasy X with its composers, the legendary Nobuo Uematsu, Masashi Hamauzu, and Junya Nakano. Final Fantasy X was the first time in the franchise that the series called upon the talents of multiple composers. Uematsu is a god, of course, as we all know, and his contributions to Final Fantasy can never be overstated. But as many of us know, and some of us are going to find out, Especially Hamaruzu's work on this game was just nothing short of brilliant, and combined with Uematsu's genius, it elevated things to a truly special level. Nakano is the least known of the three, and his legacy doesn't have the same presence, but he definitely had a meaningful presence and role in the soundtrack of Final Fantasy X. In terms of the format moving forward, what I have is a translation of an interview that was conducted with this trio, where they go through many of the tracks that they created for the game, and they have a discussion about some of the development process, maybe some behind the scenes and how they felt about these particular tracks. So of course I'm going to be playing the tracks in question in the background as we go through, with just some general accompanying visuals from the game, and I'll be sharing with you a loose translation of the interview that these three had, to hopefully bring to light some more cool things and secrets about the development of Final Fantasy X. Thank you once again to Dawn for the translations. Without her, this video would not be able to exist. Let's get into it and talk about the music of Final Fantasy X and listen to the words of Uematsu, Hamauzu, and Nakano. To begin with, of course, we have the most iconic track of the game, To Zanakund. This is that piece where you literally hear the first two or three seconds and you instantly know what it is and it takes you to another world. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's the second track on the first disc. The composer slash arrangement is by Nobuo Uematsu and he is the first one to talk about this particular track. He talks about the fact that this is a track that he had worked on a long time before he ever got to Final Fantasy X and he had been curious about how a track featuring a flute recital by Kazunori Sio, a flute player, would sound in a video game. He originally thought that the mood of the song would be a bit too sad if he used a flute recital, so it wasn't something that he used previously, but he always liked the way that the chorus came in, but he wanted to use it on a project someday in the future. Once Final Fantasy X came around, he spent a little bit more time finishing it and perfecting it, and had the staff listen to it. And once he received a really positive reception from the staff, he wondered if it's something that he could potentially use in the game. Hamauzu then remembers when the staff heard the song for the first time in the opening scene, and he talks about how everyone just seemed really buzzed and the motivation of the staff was really high upon hearing it for the first time. Uematsu of course then mentions that there are elements of this song and melody that are included in other tracks in the game, especially Suteki Dane. Then to round off this first track here, he says the piano that you hear in the final version of the game is of course played by a very professional and top level pianist, but during development it was his own piano playing version that was used right up until the very end. He laughs about it and says yes, it was a dangerous decision to try and do something like that. Next up is Tidus' theme, it's the fourth track from the first disc. The composer and the arrangement comes from Nobuo Uematsu once again. This one is interesting because the track that he initially used as Tidus' theme was one that he changed later on in development. And that track is actually The Blitzers. So unsurprisingly, when he first saw the character of Tidus and started to think about how he would create the music for him, the blitzball element was something that was obviously important to him. It was lively and energetic. So he ended up making the track that would later go on to be known as The Blitzers. 
But once he made that track, he wasn't completely satisfied with how it turned out as Tynus' theme, because he goes on to say that Tynus is not always that energetic. Sometimes he's more pensive, and sometimes he's remembering Ject. And so he went on to make a slower arrangement of the song that would suit those kind of scenes better and to give a more complete picture of Tynus' character. And he goes on to say, I liked this one better in the end. So that's pretty interesting. Originally, the Blitzers was meant to be Tynus' theme, but he went on to actually create a different arrangement of it that he believed suited the character better. And of course, I agree with his assessment. The Blitzers does work well for the Blitz scenes, but I think for Tyus' theme, I think the one that he ended up with in the end was really, really good. Hamauzu then says, I'm arranging some songs for the Piano Collection CD right now, but this song is actually the most difficult. I can't imagine it as a piano song. It sounds like a simple song, but on the other hand, the extent of the harmony is limited, so the originality of the arrangement is very difficult to produce. Even if I wanted to add an interesting harmony, it just made me feel uncomfortable. So I have a strong impression that it's a difficult song for me these days. And then he laughs. So I don't think I've actually listened to the piano collections from start to finish, and I think as a result of this particular part of the interview, I'll play back the Tyus' theme from the piano collection so you can see what he ended up doing after giving this interview, which is pretty cool. So now, once again, we have one of the most iconic, epic, and memorable pieces of the Final Fantasy X soundtrack, which is Otherworld, track 5 on disc 1, composer and arrangement from Nobo Uematsu. Of course, it's the man himself that talks about this track first, and it's, it's kind of a bit cheeky. I don't know how serious he's being from the translation here. He says that it's often said that death metal in Final Fantasy is surprising or new. But he just says that it was a coincidence that up until this point, there hasn't really been a scene that would have matched that kind of music in the franchise. Hamuzu then talks about how he felt the first time he heard it, and says that he enjoyed that there was a song of this type in the soundtrack, especially this time around for this game. Nakano then says not limited to that song, but also various other genres that appeared in this soundtrack. Then Uematsu goes on to say, I tried this kind of song and I found that it was really interesting. It's kind of like going back to where I used to be. I spent more time with these band formations than with orchestras. I'm still nervous when I'm recording in an orchestra, but if you're someone who plays the guitar or hits the drums, I've been around them for a long time and I find it much more relaxing and comfortable. And then he talks about someone called Alexander Smith, and he is the person who was in charge of the translation of the overseas version of the song. The final part of the story is that Smith actually happened to meet the vocalist for Otherworld, who is Bill Muir, in a bar. And that's how he ended up becoming a part of the project and ended up immortalizing the lyrics written by Smith and ended up being the voice that you hear in the song. So that's some behind the scenes of Otherworld. Alright then, next up we have a track that we would have all heard absolutely endless times, the battle theme. Track 9, disc 1. Composer and arrangement by Nobuo Uematsu. He says, This song had a bad reputation in the beginning. During development there was a place like a survey box where you could write down your opinion on Final Fantasy X as we were developing it. Then he talks about Kitase telling him, that there are some votes in the box that are saying that the battle song is not good. But despite being told this, Uematsu stood by the battle theme and he said I didn't think it was a bad song. He did think about it and if it continued to get more people saying that they weren't happy with it, it was something he was considering changing. But in the end, other than those first few bits of feedback, there wasn't enough negativity overall for him to consider removing it from the final track listing. Hamuzu also says that I didn't think it was a bad track either. Then Nakano says, by the way, isn't a battle song similar to one you've made before? Uematsu says, it's about the same thing really, and he laughs. He says, I was trying to make a song that was completely different, but when I completed it, there were times when the melody was the part of a song that I made a long time ago. 
He says even though it did change a little once I noticed it during the process, in the end I didn't care so much that it sounded like something made previously, I wanted to stick with it. But it is pretty interesting that he did get some negative feedback because the battle theme of Final Fantasy X I don't think it's one of those where when you're talking about the best battle themes in the series, Final Fantasy X probably isn't really up there that much I would say. There's some amazing like one-off or like very rarely used battle themes but the regular one I would say is not one of the strongest tracks in the series just as a, as a personal opinion on that one. So it was interesting to read that there was a little bit of negative feedback from the team as well about that one but Uematsu stuck to his guns and I mean it's not a bad track by any means but I do think it actually wasn't one of the greatest tracks in the game. Next up, we have Enemy Attack, track 16, disc 1. Composer arrangement by Nakano. So this is the first track that we're going to hear of that was actually made by Nakano. He says, This is the first song I made when I joined the Final Fantasy series. He says that at that point, none of us three had made a song, so I had no idea what I was doing, and he laughs. He says, Because I couldn't fully understand what the vibe was, and he didn't quite have the guidance from Hamauzu and Uematsu in those early stages, he decided to make sure he was conscious of the kind of music that was made in the past of Final Fantasy, and have that be the strongest creative template that he had for the track that he was working on. He talks about the fact that originally there was a song that started on around the 20th bar of this particular version, but in the end he decided that the impact was not strong enough, so he added the introductory part later on in the development. And yeah, when you think about the intro part of that song, you know, the, the stronger, more impactful intro, I definitely think makes the song better. So in my humble opinion, I think it was a good idea to include that intro as well. Uematsu talks about liking the track because it was one that was easy to use in many situations and Hamauzu says very early on in the first scenes it was this song that played during the battle. And again, it's a good one, I do like that track. Okay, next up we have, again, for me, one of the most standout, iconic, and memorable tracks of Final Fantasy, and that is The Hymn of the Faith. Track 20, Disc 1. Composer Uematsu, Arrangement Hamauzu. So we have a more formally collaborative effort on this track. Uematsu begins the conversation by saying, I received an order for a song from Kitase and Nojima who are writing the script. He only made the main melody and all the other heavy and intricate parts were arranged by Hamauzu. Hamauzu then says, including each of the solo performances, I think I made more than 10 variations of the hymn. Uematsu then says that he's glad that there was a variety of arrangements made, and that it was able to suit different areas of the game better when it was used. He says if he was doing it on his own, he might not have been able to create a track that could cover such a wide spectrum of different areas and feelings within the game. He actually says Hamauzu is a vocalist too, so that was an added X factor in creating this. Hamauzu then says, isn't the original melody quite mysterious? That's why I thought it would be quite difficult to add a normal harmony, so I tried to make it a bit more of a complicated configuration. Thanks to the great vocal performances of the singers, it ended up being well executed. This next bit is a little bit difficult for me to decipher, but as I understand it, Uematsu talks about wanting to put together a choir made up of people that sung in the Final Fantasy VII soundtrack, but he says all of the tracks that required a choir, except for the ones in Final Fantasy IX, are sung by people that are already familiar with Hamauzu. He says that's why I arbitrarily called it the Hammer Whirlpool and Laugh. So I think what he's trying to get at here is that Hamauzu, because he's a vocalist himself, I think he's someone that has a lot more of that kind of crowd and environment. So when it comes to putting together a choir to record these tracks, Hamauzu is generally the man with the better connections than Uematsu. So it was Hamauzu himself that ended up finding the vocalist that sung during the Hymn of the Faith. And he says that the people that sang were my acquaintances slash friends while I was a student. And using those guys, I put together a choir with a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. He says even though the lyrics were a little strange because it's obviously in a made-up language, 
the vocalist still did a great job of singing very naturally and adding the kind of feeling that he wanted to be associated with the actual meaning of the words being sung. Uematsu then says, by the way, why didn't Hamuzu himself sing this time? Hamuzu laughs and says, no, I only dipped my feet with Sephiroth's song One Winged Angel from Fire Fantasy VII. So there you go, Hamuzu was actually part of the choir that sung in the original recording of One Winged Angel. So that's a pretty cool little behind the scenes bit of info from the Ultimania. <laughs> Next up is a track that we know all too well, but probably not for the most positive of reasons, and that is The Cloister of Trials. Track 22, Disc 1, Composer Arrangement, Uematsu. I think In Isolation is actually a really cool track, but because of what it's associated with in the game, and obviously The Cloister of Trials, especially the first time we did them, they, they end up being pretty tedious and annoying, and in repeat playthroughs, especially places like Bevel and stuff were absolutely terrible, and annoying, so I don't think people have particularly good memories of the Cloister of Trials, and as a result I think the track itself is probably not very well loved, but it's an interesting one to, to hear them talk about regardless. So, Uematsu says, The song itself is so simple that I really wanted something else to be hidden and included in the track. So I asked another staff member to try and put in some sounds that sounded a bit like a monogram or like magic slash spells. Then he laughs, and my assumption is because he wanted something to be very subtle slash hidden in the piece, he goes on to say that he doesn't actually know what they ended up putting in while he laughs. Then he mentions that the Asian-like impression is stronger than some of the other tracks in the song because it uses an Indian musical instrument called a sitar. Then there's a funny little moment where Hamauzu says, when I listen to this song, I remember how hard it was during the game. So we are definitely not alone in not particularly enjoying the closer of trials. Hamuzu struggled too, so it's all good. Then Uematsu and Nakano both sort of recite lines from the game that you'd hear during the Cloister of Trials. So Uematsu says, like, this is a sphere, and Nakano says, it won't open. And they both start laughing, obviously reminiscing about the frustrations of trying to get through the Cloister of Trials. Okay then, my friends, we are now moving on to disc two, and we have The Calm Before the Storm, another one of my favorites. It's a really, really nice vibe, especially in Makalani, I think, when you listen to it. It really fits the mood of that place so well. It's always a beautiful, chill vibe, and I really do enjoy it. So let's see what they had to say for this one. It's disc four of track two, composer and arrangement, Noguo Uematsu. Okay, so this is one of the few parts of the interview that's actually technical and, and features musical terminology that I'm not really familiar with. But in general, because most of it wasn't very technical, it's still something that even I, as a non-musician, wanted to share with you guys anyway. But for this particular bit, I do think you need a bit more musical knowledge to understand what they're talking about. Uematsu says, personally, I like the songs that have a guitar. I think that the arpeggio is playing different phases on the left and right, and it doesn't get confused. There is a pattern that flows repeatedly. So we're going to have a little intermission here because this is a, a part of the video that once I finished recording it, I really wasn't happy with how it turned out because it's one of the few sections that is more genuinely technical when it comes to music. And if you don't know what an arpeggio is, you can't really appreciate what exactly they're talking about here. And even while I was recording the initial voiceover, I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I had someone that could just explain what the arpeggio was in the video so that you guys wouldn't have to rely on me to do it? So I enlisted the help of someone who really does know their stuff when it comes to this topic, and I'm hoping it's going to be a voice that many of you watching this video are going to be familiar with. So I'll have them take it away and explain to us what the arpeggio is and how it relates to this particular track. Hey Dan, to explain this in a simple way, let's act as if every single note we can play is a different elemental attack in Final Fantasy. Like this is fire, and this is ice, and this is thunder, right? When we put all three together, we get this. It's not one single element, it's three elements together which create a specific new sort of vibe. That is called a chord, putting notes together to get a very cool feeling. An arpeggio is similar, but instead of casting multiple spells at once, you play one after the other in a way that sounds very cool and rhythmic. 
these notes are being played in a rhythm and in a pattern that we haven't heard, but the notes that are being played are the exact ones I showed at the beginning with the chords. In Calm Before the Storm, there's one arpeggio like this playing on the left. And on the right, we have another arpeggio that does this. When you put them all together, you get this. And then it kind of changes throughout the track. This is a very cool thing to do to create a sense of mantra. There's one thing happening on the left, one on the right, and it transports you to a whole different plane of existence. Yeah, that's actually one of my favorite tracks from Final Fantasy X. So yes, my friends, that was the wonderful Alex Mukala who took a little bit of time to make this cameo for me on this video. I really appreciate it, dude. You did a wonderful job, as always, of breaking down these musical, like, technical things in ways that make it so much easier to understand. You are a gift to the community. So a huge thank you to Alex, and now that we're up to speed on what an arpeggio is, we can resume the video. So he says, I always make one song like this every time I'm making a game. I also like songs that use the timber of an instrument called the Mellotron. Hamuzu says, speaking of which, in Lulu's theme, the sound of the flute was played by Mellotron. Uematsu says a Mellotron is a musical instrument that's like the originator of the so-called sampling synths. Each keyboard has a tape for recording, and when you press the keyboard, the sounds recorded there will play. For some reason, no matter what major chord you play, it sounds sad. I really like that tone, and I use it a lot. The sound of the guitar and the sound of the Mellotron are my key points, and laughs. Hamuzu says the Mellotron is good because the unique fluctuations and imperfections that using the tape generates creates variation in the piece. So that conversation is hopefully one that appealed to the musicians out there, whether you're just someone that's like a hobbyist that, that knows their stuff or whether you're actually making your own music. Hopefully that one was, uh, was a cool one to know about. So next up we have the Luca theme, track 6 of disc 2, composer arrangement Nakano. He says that it was a song that I was able to make very quickly without thinking too much about it. It's pretty cool because he talks about enjoying being able to make songs that are unique to games that are going to be played in the home, unlike the previous company he used to work for where he used to make music for arcade games. He said arcade game music must have a rough rhythm and the sound must be strong. It's very difficult to make a song with more subtlety in an arcade game. Uematsu says, Nakano's song has a chorus of about 5 minutes. This is the shorter version. Nakano says perhaps that's a bit of an overreaction due to being so used to making arcade games. Until now with the music I made I had to pack a lot of things tightly in about 30 seconds. But now that I have the freedom to make different sorts of tracks, that's why I wanted to use it to the fullest extent and maybe create longer songs with more subtlety and build-up and variation across time. Okay, so to round off this video, I've got one more track to discuss with you guys. Because there's four discs, I want to break this down into disc one and two, and the next video will be disc three and four. So the final track for this one is Chocobo Jam, and that is track 14 of disc 2, composer arrangement Nobuo Uematsu. He says, every time I arrange a chocobo song, I have to worry about it. The idea is to play with it and have fun without trying to touch the melody itself. I don't want to create a feeling of unexpectedness or surprise when they're listening to the track. He then says that this is the first time I worked with a big orchestra when I was making one of these chocobo tracks. Hamuzu then says that the Chocobo theme must be the most rearranged track that has appeared in a Square game. If you were to make a CD with only Chocobo songs, it would be about two discs, and he laughs. Uematsu says, Nakano, how would you arrange it? Hamuzu then takes a jab at Nakano's longer tracks, I assume, and he says, isn't it about five minutes long? And he laughs. Then Nakano also laughs, and he says it would take about two minutes before the main melody comes in. Then Uematsu jokes about how difficult it's becoming to name these chocobo themes because they're rearranging it so many times and they have to find short names that work for every single new arrangement of the song that they have for the future and the three of them are laughing about it. So it ends on a pretty fun and positive note with one of the most legendary tracks in the Final Fantasy franchise, the chocobo theme. So this is where I'm going to round off the first video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and you got to hear some stories and some behind the scenes of some of the greatest tracks from the music of Final Fantasy X. 
I will hopefully be back soon with the next part where we will be covering CD3 and CD4. And just as a little preview of some of the tracks to come, we have a Jex theme coming up. We've got Suteki Dane. We have a fleeting dream. And we have the final battle. So hopefully there's going to be some more cool stories for me to share with you guys. And we'll get to listen to some of the best music once again from the Final Fantasy X soundtrack. So I'll see you guys for the next one. Thank you for watching. Take care.